All right, so here's the thing about self-improvement morality. It turns hostily against the passions. Right? It's um, by Nietzsche's estimation, morality is anti-nature, uh, all uh, centered around the slogan, one must kill the, 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 the passions. He, from 46 here, the most famous formula for this is to be found in the New Testament in the Sermon on the Mount, where incidentally things are by no means looked at from a height. There it said, for example, with particular reference to sexuality, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Fortunately, no Christian acts in accordance with this precept, destroying the passions and cravings, merely as a preventative measure against their stupidity and the unpleasant consequences of this stupidity today. This itself strikes us merely as another acute form of stupidity. We no longer admire dentists who pluck out teeth so that they will not hurt anymore. Right? So what Nietzsche is arguing here is that uh, largely morality is disposed to the passions in a way that's hostile towards the passions. Right? Um, it was the case in Socrates. It was the case in Plato. To a certain extent, um, Aristotle was more sensible in getting us to sort of craft our character so that we tended towards moderation rather than extremes. Then it's a little more sensible. It, Nietzsche doesn't really engage with Aristotle here. But nonetheless, um, the Christian morality, insofar as it adopted Plato and an extreme version of Plato, turns hostily against the, 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 the senses. Every now and again, um, I played that scene from um, Monty Python, uh, Search for the Holy Grail, where the monks are walking on, uh, chanting in Latin, God give me peace, God give me rest, and then whacking themselves in the head with their planks, right? That turns hostily against the body, hostily against the passions, and largely what they're doing is inflicting pain upon themselves as penance for experiencing their passions. Another good example of this is John the Christian from uh, Ados Huxley's Brave New World. Whenever he had dirty desires or fell into some sort of sensual um, trance, as was the case in the Brave New World where he found himself, um, what he would do is leave the city and go out and whip himself. He would give himself pain as penance for feeling these dirty desires, right? Um, it's all throughout. Um, it's it, it, it very prevalent in certain Christian sects, that sort of thing. The attempt is to effectively attempt to castrate those passions. But even in more modernist morality, we become in, in Kantian terms, or even in terms of utility, interesting moral beings insofar as we can use reason to limit our passions. Right? This is where morality becomes interesting with regard to these later figures. Right? It's reason right, that is at work in moral decision making and not the passions. Right? So effectively what Nietzsche is concerned about in terms of anti-natural morality is a hostile sort of disposition to the passions. Right? Um, and this statement about if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, pinning it to sexual desires, what Nietzsche wants to point out, I'll just read it again, fortunately no Christian acts in accordance with this precept, destroying the passions and cravings merely as a preventative measure against their stupidity and unpleasant consequences. Consequences of this stupidity today itself strikes us as merely another form of stupidity. I mean, what he's pointing out, especially about our sexual desires, if we, in a sense, castrate those passions, well, here's the problem. Where do people come from? Where do people come from? Right. So what Nietzsche is going to do is critique this kind of morality on the basis of its hostility towards life. Right. Um, he tells this uh, 47, but an attack on the roots of passion means an attack on the roots of life. The, the practice of the church is hostile to life. And then he 
<clears throat> it criticizes this 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 attempt to exterminate the passions, calling it a form of trans uh, uh, castration. Um, and largely, right, uh, what he does is he explores these passions as something that we should be able to, in a sense, direct and control with our will. Remember, reason is just a tool of the passion. Socrates' bait and switch doesn't work out. Why? Because reason in and of itself is not enough, right? It isn't a potent enough tool. It's just largely the right hand of the passions itself. So becoming rational, becoming systematic about your passions is not going to work. First off, it's hostile towards life. Secondly, we become just these dead systematizing things. So he says, the, the, the same means in the fight against uh, a craving, castration, extermination is instinctively chosen by those who are too weak-willed, too degenerate to be able to impose moderation on themselves, by those who are so uh, uh, constituted that they require a tra the Trappist order, a systematic kind of blah blah blah, uh, to use a figure of speech, or without any figure of speech, some kind of definitive de declaration of hostility, a cleft between themselves and passion. Radical means are indispensable only for the degenerate, the weakness of the will, or to speak more definitively, the inability not to respond to stimulus is itself merely a for another form of degeneration. The radical hostility, uh, the deadly hostility against sensuality is always a symptom to reflect on. It entitles us to uh, superstition, uh, sorry, suppositions concerning the total state of one who is excessive in this manner. All right. So to turn to reason, to turn to system, in order to battle against, in order to try to defeat these passions, it's an extreme form of degenerate nature. It's an extreme form of helplessness, weak-willedness, right, according to Nietzsche. Now, what he wants to suggest in the place of reason controlling the passions, which we know doesn't work because it's a bait and switch, right, is what he calls the spiritualization of sensuality. And he gives us two examples. Um, you can find his treatment of these examples on 488. I've got my own way to explain it. Um, the spiritualization of sens sensuality called love, it represents a great triumph over Christianity. Another triumph over is our spiritualization of hostility. It consists in a profound, appre a profound appreciation of the value of having enemies. In short, it means acting and thinking in the opposite way from which has been the rule. Now, interestingly, what he wants to argue here, and we'll start off with the example of love, is that think about the first time you were in love and you just couldn't get a hold of yourself. It's much like Plato was describing in um, the Phaedrus early on, where you're just like, you know, Bella in Twilight, I would die for you like five minutes after meeting the person. It's this just, you're overcome, you're overwhelmed by the emotion. But, as you get older and more experienced and maybe have had your heart broken a couple of times, you become more level-headed about the emotion. And what's more, what you wind up doing is you wind up harnessing the emotion in order for it to become productive. Right? Now, interestingly... I might argue our culture tends to infantilize us. Right? We're raised on this sort of Disney happily ever after notion of love, and this might actually account for a good deal of the failed marriages um, in our culture as well, because you get married, you have this big party, and you live happily ever after like the prince and princess on the top of the bloody wedding cake. But sadly, Monday morning, your alarm goes off, you make yourself coffee, and you still have to live your bloody life. Right? It, you know, 
to, our culture does not sufficiently prepare us for the hard work of engaging in a love kind of relationship, right? But nonetheless, with experience and hard work and um, self-training, we can kind of put away our childish fantasies about the happily ever after and get down to the real business of sharing a life with somebody that involving love, right? So to a certain extent, right, even though, yes, it's true, love makes us do these ridiculous, crazy, bloody things, we don't turn hostily against it. We work through it. We train ourselves. We exercise our will. We become sensible. We harness the emotion and we live it. Again, what he's talking about hostility here consists in the profound appreciation of the value of having enemies. It may seem strange the way that he's presenting it here, but very contrary to the notion of having an evil enemy that must be destroyed or an evil passion that must be castrated or something along those lines. Think about what sport and sportsmanship trains in us. We devote a lot of effort towards this and possibly because our economic system is based on competition that does not become a violent sort of destruction of the, the, the opposing force, right? Our economic system actually breeds a good deal of healthy competition. Think about it in terms of sport. I often, when I'm teaching this stuff in the summer, point out that uh, I have several friends who I golf with. Some just never really got good at the game, and what happens when I golf with these people? I play down to them. Uh, it's not really, it, I, I know I shouldn't, but nonetheless, right, I play down to them. Why? Because I don't have to exercise a lot of effort to wind up lower on the bloody scorecard. Right? Whereas, when I golf with people who are better than me, I push myself and I push my game to become better, etc., etc., etc. And that kind of healthy competition, opposition, that sort of thing, it invigorates and helps us engage with life. Now, I might be the old-fashioned kind. Uh, I play video games, right? But... I play the old-fashioned way. I fight the bots. I fight the machines and that sort of thing. And I play through and I play through. And sometimes right at the beginning of a video game, it's really, really challenging and I can't put it down. And it's really exciting. And you're just trying to push further and that sort of thing, right? But there comes a moment when eventually you kind of you beat the game, right? And at that point, the game no longer really holds a challenge for you. It no longer really forces you to innovate and engage with it. And at that point, you put down the game and just, you, you know. I had the same thing with chess. I really enjoyed playing chess. And when I was learning to play chess, I would pick up any bloody game of chess that I could, right? And I would enjoy, I would enjoy winning. I would enjoy losing. I would enjoy thinking through problems. I would enjoy comp competing and that sort of thing. Problem was, I got really good, and it's hard to find somebody that plays as good a game at chess. So, for the longest time now, I haven't really been able to find a good game. So I put it down. I haven't played chess in a long bloody time, and I'm sure those skills have atrophied. Right? Well, interestingly, what Nietzsche is talking about here, I mean... There's a certain childish kind of competition. Somebody beats you at a game, you pout, you wind up hating that person, that sort of thing. Sportsmanship tells us and trains us to engage in these kind of agons, in these kind of competitions, right? And those competitions help us to harness these instincts, these passions, and direct them in a productive, healthy, life-affirming way that challenges us to become more and better and to engage with life 
in a more profound way. Now, interestingly, what Nietzsche wants to propose here is something even more fundamental than having, you know, an external competitor. And this is this is why Nietzsche would take a look at how I relate to my golf game, shake his head and say weak-willed, right? because I play down to my competitor. Why is this a problem? Well, take this passage, bottom of 488. Our attitude to the internal enemy is no different. Here, we have spiritualized hostility. Here, too, we have come to appreciate its value. The, the, price, of, um, uh, the, the, the pr price of fruitlessness is to be rich in internal opposition. One remains young only as long as the soul does not stretch itself out in the desire for peace. Nothing has become more alien to us than the highly desirable state of former times. Peace of the soul the Christian highly desirable state. There's nothing uh, we envy less than the moralistic cow and that fat happiness of the good consciousness. One has renounced uh, the great life when one renounces war. So what Nietzsche is getting at here is that largely the internal conflict challenging ourselves privately within ourselves to become more than what we are. Right? is ultimately going to be the greatest and most worthy challenge of our abilities. Here we have spiritualized hostility, right? It may seem strange, right? But setting challenges for ourselves and achieving those challenges, those goals. I mean, I, I might use doing a PhD as an example because it's a very, very hard thing and you're not trying to beat anybody else. Well, if you are, you're misunderstanding the endeavor. What you're trying to do is expand your capacities and expand your horizons while well, doing a PhD, doing an undergraduate degree the same way. You've got to have your own reasons to engage with this and it's an attempt to overcome your limitations. So your limitations become like the enemy and you're trying to expand your capacities. Right? So what you've done is you've sort of spiritualized an internal conflict. Right? So what this requires for Nietzsche is not the blunt opposition of this passion or that passion, but rather the harnessing and the directing of these passions towards expanding your capacities, right? So, <clears throat> blunt opposition, opposition of the sort that a lot of these moralities, right, is sort of emphasize with regard to us, right? Well, just have a formula and live your life by the formula have a set of principles and always enact those principles. It has us being lifeless, passionless systematizers. Right? Rather than that, what, light, uh, what Nietzsche is suggesting here is a way to live a passionate life. Now, a quick word about how reason might fit in here. Nietzsche is not saying be irrational. Just don't treat reason as the organizing principle, the ultimate force, right? Because it can't account for the human element of passion. So, <laughs> interestingly and ironically, uh, in section four of this, the, the, of morality is anti-nature on p your page 489, um, and you'll get the irony of this, right? I reduce principle to formula. What I was just saying about systems and principles and formulas, it, Nietzsche's it, it got that in mind as he's writing this and he's being ironical here, right? He says, every naturalism and morality, that is every healthy morality is dom dominated by an instinct of life. Some commandment of life is fulfilled by the determinate canon of shalt and shalt not. Some in inhibition and hostile element on the path of life is thus removed, right? So this is decisively not living by principles and formulas. Largely what you're doing is you're rising to meet your own challenges and understanding that your way of living your life, your shalts and shalt nots, 
your oughts and ought nots, right, are going to be in the service of life. So rather than reason as the unifying principle, living life, the instinct to life, health, maintaining a healthy disposition, right, this is going to be the key for naturalized morality according to Nietzsche. And yet natural morality, again 489, that is almost every morality which um, has so far been taught, revered, and preached turns conversely against the instincts of life. It's a condemnation of these instincts, now secret, now outspoken and impudent, right? So ideally what we want to do is engage with our instincts and our passions rather than try to castrate them. And that's what Nietzsche is getting at here, right? Now, largely this starts by placing value in life, right? So he engages on 491 with this idea of man ought to be such and such, this, this, this self-improvement morality, this holding up an ideal paragon that everybody ought to emulate, right? This is problematic, I mean, insofar as you're going to have to be your own person. Right? You ought to be such and such. He does not cease to make himself ridiculous. The single human being is a piece of fatum from the front and from the rear. No one, <clears throat> one law more, one necessity more <clears throat> for all that is uh, yet, uh, yet to come and to be. To say to him, change yourself and demand, demand that everything be changed is even retro, uh, uh, changed even retroactively and indeed there have been <coughs> consistent moral or um, yeah, consistent moralists who wanted man to be different that is virtuous wanted they wanted him to uh, remade into their own image as a prig to that end they negated the world no small madness no modest kind of immodesty right so effectively when morality or moralists present you with a moral system and say well all you got to do is live by this moral system and you'll automatically be good people well the problem with that is that you know largely what the moralist is asking you to do is to become like they say you should what Nietzsche wants you to become is yourself so even clearer 491 and we'll go out on this one morality insofar as it condemns for its own sake and not out of regard for the concerns and considerations and contrivances of life is a specific error with which one ought to have no pity an idiosyncrasy of degenerates which has caused immeasurable harm we others we are moralists have conversely made room in our hearts for every kind of understanding, comprehending, and approving. We do not easily negate. We make it a point of honor to be affirmers. More and more, our eyes have opened to the economy, which needs and knows how to utilize all the holy witlessness of the priest, the diseased reason of the priest that rejects that economy in the law of life, which finds an advantage even in the disgusting species of prigs, the priests, the virtuous. What advantage? But we ourselves, we are moralists, are the answer. Right? So, effectively, morality is anti-nature. It's if, if I were dumbing this down to sort of a Cosmo sort of title, right? Naturalism and morality and the value of being yourself might be that title, right? But effectively what Nietzsche is saying is don't just turn bluntly against your instincts and your passions merely because they make you occasionally do something stupid. The real greatness in human life has to do with working through our passions, even though they might be difficult. You can't systematize your way through this. You can't 12-step your way through this. What you have to do is do the hard, 
existential labor of living your life as you and finding a way to express yourself in a way that affirms rather than negates life, right? So live your life in service of life rather than in negation of it, right? Which I think is very consistent with that the greatest stress passage that I started from the gay signs by reading you. This life, as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more. If you spend your entire time in your life turning host hostily against the instincts and passions that constitute your engagement with this life, right, then that sounds like an awful, awful life, and one that anybody would have a hard time saying yes to in the final analysis. Right? Now, you may perceive some far-off reward for all of your suffering and hard work and, and sublimating your desires and killing your passions and beating down your instincts and that sort of thing. There's some sort of happily ever after problem is that happily ever after is going to be hard work too or it's just not going to be so realistically for Nietzsche the goal is to craft for yourself values that challenge you that push you to become more than what you are that will ground your projects in a context, context of meaning right, and make you a better human being. Reason to tool is not saying be irrational, right, but largely reason itself can only build systems. Values are built through passion. Right? So to a certain extent, is similar to Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard's solution was faith, right? We should take the leap of faith and then all of our choices in our life will have meaning. Right? He was trying to reinvigorate a specific system of doing just this. Well, Nietzsche wants to argue that this system that, that, that has done this, well, it's based on a metaphysics that would, well, have us confuse the last and the first, that would distrust the senses, that would turn hostily against the instincts, that would it largely foster within us a disposition that contradicts the goal of adopting the system in the first bloody place. Right? So it, what Nietzsche wants us to do is become affirmers. Even as I'm criticizing, I am affirming. Right, so it, it, this is ultimately in one of his slightly later works what he means by morality beyond good and evil. Evil we condemn, good we sort of as an afterthought affirm. Right, well, he wants to get beyond all of that, he wants a purely affirmative morality, one that is capable of invigorating our life and saying yes, yes, yes. Right, rather than one that condemns and its primary move is to say no, no, no. Right. So, anyhow, that's Nietzsche. I hope you enjoyed. Um, all right, take care.